Hello and welcome to uh, the second edition of Haskellers 2022. Um, I'm very happy that again so many people have made it here. Um, our speaker today is the uh, one and only uh, inimitable Alex, uh, who is a uh, self-professed uh, C++ expert, Haskell no, no, no. enthusiast, and uh, Mr. Nick's also. Also runs the uh, Zurich XOS users group uh, meetup. So um, for any Nix fellow Nix enthusiasts or people who are curious about that meetup, uh, I encourage you to go check it out meetup.com. Um, and his current talk today is going to be about uh, using Nix, among other things, to uh, remove some of the barriers to entry for uh, getting started with running Haskell. So please give it up for Alex. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, so as Kazim has mentioned, my name is Alex. I will be talking about Haskell, Nix, and a variety of other uh, topics of importance today. Uh, the full title of this talk is uh, a Haskell primer, or how I learned to stop worrying and love the monad, which is um, totally not a, like a, it's a legally ambiguous reference. Uh, there are occasions, uh, as Gwendolyn said, in the importance of being earnest, in which it is not only a moral duty to speak one's mind, but also a pleasure. So it is my pleasure to be uh, in front of you today to deliver this talk, uh, but it's also, um, I'm also very humbled. This talk is a, uh, a result of several years of mostly learning, but also teaching um, brilliant individuals the art of Haskell. Uh, there have been countless conversations that have contributed to this talk. Um, a special shout out to uh, our friend and colleague, Valentin, who took a last minute flight just to be here, uh, and who has been instrumental in the creation of this talk. So um, today I'll try to disentangle a monumental effort of learning a language. Um, and as with any language, it is mostly a social rather than a technical challenge. Um, and as such, the talk will be more on the philosophical than the technical side. Uh, it's a spiritual continuation of the talk we had last time when Kazim was presenting what makes Haskell Haskell. Uh, today I'll be more talking about why Haskell being Haskell is um, potentially appealing. Uh, I've split the talk into three parts, um, each of which is uh, honestly deserving of its own talk, but this is an ambitious endeavor, so um, bear with me here. The first of which, uh, ah, yes, the first of which will be motivation, um, and I've prefaced it with the following quote by Euclid, which he might, might have well said, there is no royal road to Haskell, this is why this talk exists. Um, so, we'll start with motivation. Uh, we will proceed with uh, getting started, and finally I'll have a few uh, comments on how to learn the language uh, itself proper. All right, All right. let's start with um, motivation. A question that commonly pops up in beginners' minds is who exactly Haskell is intended for? Who is the target audience of Haskell? Now, when we talk about what Haskell is, it's very easy to say it's a functional programming language or it has, you know, it's a lazy, strict and such uh, language. But this doesn't answer to the, um, to the student if, whether or not they are in the target audience for this. Now, in trying to, in trying to understand or uh, trying to answer this question more faithfully, um, I think an, uh, a valuable observation is that programming languages roughly fall on a spectrum of abstraction, or rather the power of abstraction. This is to say um, how, how uh, theoretical or abstract the um, language, how theoretically uh, or abstractly the language expresses uh, computation. And, um, you know, as, any, as anyone who has read much about Haskell uh, knows, Haskell is predominantly uh, peopled by a demographic called language researchers. So, indeed, uh, Haskell came into existence as a tool for communication between, I hope the resolution is okay, yeah, as a, as a tool for communication between people who are researching the merits and strength of um, uh, lazy functional programming. And this is, this is perhaps the demographic that it is most known for, uh, the most famous for. Uh, it is basically the, pro, the language researcher's playground. And this is the one that is the most visible. So there's no doubt that Haskell is for language researchers. 
But language researchers exist on a very extreme end of the abstraction spectrum. And if this is one extreme, then something I call data scientists would be on the other extreme. Now, this is in no way intended to be um, you know, derogatory to uh, data scientists. Um, it is just that the nature of the problems that they tackle, or rather the um, means of doing so, differs significantly from what language researchers uh, do in their daily lives. Data scientists normally have or usually have some input data that they wish to transport some, to some out, uh, transform to some output data. And the output of the computation is of primary interest to them. The means of performing the calculation is uh, a side effect or like a second uh, class citizen. Um, to a language researchers, it is uh, of equal value whether the computation was done on paper and pencil or on a calculator which discards the computation or in a programming language such as Python where uh, you know, the uh, code is brittle and error prone but as long as it produces the correct result, um, the result is what we care for and the code is just a vehicle for getting there. So these two are uh, extreme ends of the spectrum because they care about very different things. Um, where language researchers um, philosophize and spend their days thinking about how not to repeat themselves or how to express computation in the most pure and correct possible way, languages, uh, sorry, uh, data scientists um, s tend to value a lower abstraction ceiling because um, when reading code that performs computation, it is often valuable to them that the code is close to the values that it's transforming. So basically having low abstraction it makes, the, makes it clearer to them what the code is doing. Um, so as this is a spectrum, uh, and these are two extremes, we have a demographic in between as well. The majority of the programming world, perhaps, uh, software engineers who are um, perhaps most of us here today. Um, now, their usage of the language is one where, most, most of the time, one where the, the code that is being written, written to solve a problem is the product. So it so happens that there is probably an input, there's pro the code probably produces an output, but neither the input or the out nor the output are the actual heart or the business value that's being produced. The code itself is the, um, the thing of value. And so software engineers um, take great care to write code that lives over time, that uh, avoids accidental or otherwise complexity. Um, and um, also they tend to avoid uh, repeating themselves too much to stay productive. Um, so the interesting thing that happens with the spectrum is that language researchers come up with uh, a, a way of writing code without necessarily writing too much code. Data scientists uh, tend to write code only as, uh, only as a byproduct, and software engineers sit in between because they take the output from the uh, the, the output from the research uh, demographic, um, and then perhaps provide the tools uh, for the data scientists. So to recap, who is Haskell really for? Well, we know that language researchers um, have a lot of fun with Haskell. Um, and, uh, and as I mentioned, data scientists perhaps do not necessarily appreciate abstraction. So I would say that this talk uh, um, mostly focuses on software engineers, or rather why Haskell is a good tool for software engineering. It, it can be, um, it can be um, interesting to all three demographics or to the entire breadth of uh, the programming community. In fact, you know, uh, Haskell is a general purpose programming language. But um, today I'll mostly be focusing on how to show its merits to a software engineer, to a person who cares about abstraction. All right, so a common a common blocker um, <laughs> when talking to people about uh, Haskell, well, that's probably a bit too generous, when trying to convince people that Haskell is great, is that they already know some language, right? They know C++ or Python or whatever. They, they have tools in their tool belt, and why should they um, necessarily care to add another? Um, so <laughs> learning Haskell is a... Uh, Ha incurs a large cost, obviously. There's opportunity cost, there's the cost to your uh, sanity, <laughs> there's also um, you know, a, a, a very frustrating uh, learning curve uh, to overcome. So how do we, how do we um, motivate this initial investment is the question. How do we um, 
bring in front of their eyes an image that, uh, that makes them wish to actually uh, pursue this uh, language. So we all, uh, as Kazim pointed out last time, uh, Haskell is a unique language because it offers a unique blend of powerful features such as strictness, purity, laziness. Ah, um, for, for, the, um, for the pedants among us, strictness here does not refer to uh, strict evaluation, it refers to type strictness. Um, and I think the other ones are not uh, suspect. Okay, so um, we know that Haskell provides these features, but there's a, there's a problem or rather a lack of um, a certain kind of empathy when discussing these issues. Um, people or uh, Haskell programmers that have already taken the Haskell pill um, can talk about strictness, purity, and laziness with superlatives, how it solves problems. But this is not necessarily relatable to the people that we uh, show these to, um, because, per, uh, because perhaps they don't necessarily feel that they have a problem that these things solve to begin with. There's a wonderful article uh, I read uh, relatively recently, I forgot the author, um, titled um, Locked Doors, Headaches, and Intellectual Need, which posits the following. Before trying to sell someone aspirin, show them that they have a headache. Or rather, that the worst thing to do um, if you're an aspirin salesman is to try to sell it to people who do not have a headache. And this is uh, probably prevalent in the entire tech community, that we try to sh solve people's problems before they're even aware that there is a problem. So if we are to motivate someone to learn Haskell, let's first show them that they have a problem. And this is what, uh, and oh, and of course, because Haskell is a pretty large beast, let's uh, go piecemeal and take each of these three um, features in isolation and show how they are beneficial. So let's talk about strictness, specifically, again, type strictness. Or um, again, for the more learned among us, there is such a thing as type strictness and there is such a thing as static typing and Haskell has a combination of the two. But how, to, how do we even introduce the topic of typing to those who perhaps use dynamic languages such as Python, JavaScript, and so on? I posit that Everyone who concerns themselves with the art of programming, of writing code in any language, including, including assembly, um, they are composing abstractions. They are writing functions or, uh, how are they called in assembly? Uh, procedures, thank you. Um, uh, these functions have inputs and outputs. And um, the inputs, so I'm using Haskell as an example here. Um, uh, if you're not familiar with the syntax, this function takes one input, which is bread, and produces an output, which is a sandwich. Um, the inputs to these functions or to these abstractions are understood by the programmer because they are the one who devised them. If we wrote a function make sandwich, we know that we must give it bread and out comes a sandwich. And so type checking as a mechanism that is built into the language exists only to, to verify that the um, composition of these functions, so that the sequence of function calls or abstractions or what, what have you, um, actually makes sense. And um, again, I argue that anyone who writes Python or JavaScript already does this all the time. They uh, call a function, they give it a parameter, and they already know whether or not a certain parameter makes sense or not. Now, they are fallible, they can make a mistake, but when, this, when an error pops up on the screen and they inspect the code, they will see, ah, yes, of course, calling a sandwich with an apple makes no sense. Even without type safety, or even without type checking built into the compiler, even without the compilation stage, Every programmer um, does type checking in their head. And it uh, offers, so this is, there's two ways of looking at type safety. There's the glass half empty and the glass half full um, uh, way, uh, to quote Alexis King's blog post on uh, static typing. Um, in one way, types limit what is possible, but on the other hand, they also provide us semantic information. So we have here a function uh, called eat, which takes as its parameter the output of make sandwich, and even without reading the, uh, what ETH does, we already know, we can already infer what shape or what type uh, of parameter it expects. Okay, so if we already do this in dynamic and static languages, what's the problem? So Python is a notorious, uh, well, a, a well-known and probably easy common denominator language that uh, does not have, uh, it has static typing, but it has dy dynamic, oh, sorry, it has dynamic uh, typing, but it's not, uh, but it is strict, yes. So Python has dynamic typing, 
which means that we can write some code that looks a bit funny. In this situation here, we have a, a, a number and the Boolean value true. And um, you know, the, uh, the operation of addition between them shouldn't possibly exist, and yet it does. Um, now you might think that this is not very problematic because surely true should be one and false should be zero. Um, Python also does some other funny things. For example, um, in this case, we have a function that given a certain value returns one thing, given any other value, it returns other things. Now this other things it can return um, might be um, semantically nonsense. So for example, here we have a number that we add to an array which already makes no sense. We're calling a function that doesn't exist. Um, surely this code is, you know, a uh, dumpster fire from a while away. But, how, but Python has no problem executing it for us as long as, we give it, as long as we feed it the correct inputs. The problem with this, of course, is that we have to be very thorough when evaluating Python code or any code in a dynamic language with every possible input and output um, and still have very low confidence in whether or not our code actually does what we think it does. Um, ah, I have, I have some more Python to show. So in this case, we have a, a Python class, which is a common way of, um, a, 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 you know, the other Python abstraction Python has, um, which, which can uh, hold, hold a group of values. And another interesting pattern emerges. Um, in Python, every value is nullable, uh, which means that when dealing with a variable, it's either nothing or a value. And this is implicit. There is no way to escape this. There is no such thing as strict non-nullability. Um, and a, common, uh, and a, a Python programmer that you know, is, has been burnt by this in the past and tries to uh, apply defensive programming will litter their code with checks for none. Um, and in fact, these checks for none are, there all, are then all over the place. Um, just to make sure that the computation they're performing actually uses the values that they hope that it uses. Now there's a common, there is a common um, complaint I hear about this, that this is not exactly Pythonic or idiomatic Python code, that a function such as parents here, for example, which uh, so the parents function takes a person parameter. And um, you know, a Python enthusiast might, compl might complain that it makes no sense to have a parents function given a person which can be none. So it is the caller's responsibility to call the function uh, correctly. Um, but this, but this means that every function we ever call has to be inspected. Oh, right, and how, how are we supposed to know that this person does not handle none correctly? It's in the documentation, of course, because the documentation cannot possibly be stale. No, the only way we can be possibly certain that the code does what we actually think it does is to read the definition of every function we call, litter none checks all over the place. Um, and, I, and you know, if this is not idiomatic, um, the first time I presented this exact example at a Python conference, no less, um, I was missing the person non-check, and someone in the audience raised their hand and you know, no, t told me that I'm missing a non-check. So Python programmers are very careful, because they have to be. And it's not just Python programmers. Um, every language since Java, I believe, has had the concept of null. Sorry, every language since C uh, has had the concept of null. Actually, even before C, Algol had uh, uh, nullable types. Uh, developed by Tony Hoare, who has since called it the billion dollar mistake. But of course, with the growth of uh, software engineering being what it is, it's now a trillion dollar mistake. No, uh, nullable types are uh, horrendous, and modern languages are getting rid of it. For example, in Rust and in Haskell, we have uh, explicit nullability. Ah, speaking of our beloved Java, um, Java is a common, let's say, counterexample or like the antithesis of Python. Um, where you know uh, large enterprises wish to write uh, code very defensively, very correctly. You know we're dealing with finance and uh, all sorts of uh, things that shouldn't go wrong. Uh, let's enforce types everywhere. That's the Java uh, way. So of course we end up with code which doesn't fit on the slide. Uh, that's you know a common um, a common um, complaint about Java is its verbosity. Essentially, it's so type safe that it requires us to say the same things over and over again. But that's not a, that's not Truthfully, that's not a property of type safety. That's a property of Java being very verbose. Um, um, in fact, this isn't even exactly uh, very uh, honest to Java. La um, older, uh, sorry, newer versions of Java, starting with Java 14, have added the record syntax to significantly shorten this soup. Um, but the but that just 
helps uh, make the point that type safety and ergonomics are two very desirable traits and languages are like moving towards that. Um, yeah. Oh, and of course, what, what's the problem here exactly is that it's very hard to look at this giant amount of code and parse out what is important and what is just noise. So I had to scroll all the way down for all the getters and setters, which takes some skill. And even then, the functions are needlessly, uh, are needlessly um, complicated. So now that I've shown you a headache, hopefully you agree it is a headache, let me show you what Haskell can do. So OK, uh, I've, <laughs> I designed these slides on a slightly larger screen. So sadly, the person record type doesn't wholly fit. But, hope, but you can see that it's not doing anything special. And all of these functions are, uh, can fit on this slide, complete with type signatures. What's interesting, what, what of interest is going on here? This is fully type safe. So every function declares exactly what it expects and what it returns in, the, in its type signature. Um, we, and we can trust, unlike in other languages, we can trust that what, what the function returns is actually that. If it returns a list of persons, we need not worry that these persons may or may not exist. Um, and we did, we did the same thing in Python, but with all these null checks and such. Another interesting, another thing to uh, point out here is that despite being fully type safe, it's also pretty concise. And the reason for that is that Haskell doesn't force us to, ha to litter our code with type checking or type annotations. Uh, it can infer most of these things from the code itself. So we can write a bunch of code and actually n almost never deal with types. This is valid code. I've just removed the function signatures. Those function signatures are there to help the human reader you know, uh, glance at the code and kind of have an idea what it's doing. But Haskell is perfectly capable of figuring out what types we want from three lines of code. So hopefully you agree that this is a, slight, uh, a much better situation. Oh, in fact, I snuck in a maternal grandfather function, which I didn't even bother to write in Python and Java, um, because it's just so nice. So that's, that's the aspirin I'm offering. Um, bonus round for Python. A lot of proponents for uh, dynamic typing would say that you know, uh, what is the difference between static error checking and uh, like runtime error checking when you can just run the code and get the error when it is run? Well, you know, apart from the headache I've shown earlier with, um, you know, function parameters, like return types being dependent on function parameters, there's also the following, um, the following fear, which is that we have error checking bundled with business logic. Um, who can tell me what's wrong with this um, bit of code here? Can anyone spot any mistakes, errors, any problems? No. Um, sorry? No. Sorry? Uh, no, no, that's not the problem. Sorry? No, I'm just asking people. Uh, so it's not, it, oh, uh, intofix is not a problem. That's a, that, that might be problematic in any other language, but not in uh, Python. No, it is actually the right function. The right function takes a string, not an integer. What we're giving it is an integer. You know, totally obvious from this code. Here's the problem. OK, I didn't make a screenshot of the error message, because that would have been cheeky. But what, what, what actually does this code do? It, it reads a line of input, and then it calls the right. Uh, and this write is not an append, which means that the writer will try to will first re remove the contents of the file, try to write something in, and then it will run into the string issue. It's eff effectively, we have nuked the contents of the file and then reported the error to the user. So, you know, damage has been done, and then there was an error. Um, that is the problem of mixing ta error checking with uh, bu with business logic. Okay. Enough about that. Let's talk about purity of essence. Um, what does purity mean in a programming context? Or uh, another, another fancy word for it is referential transparency for the learned among us. Uh, a function, given the same input, will always produce the same output. Um, that sounds obvious enough, right? Ah, but it will also not have side effects. So when we call our make sandwich functions, there is no fear that it will nuke Russia or whatever unless we specifically want it to talk to the world, which is called uh, IO in Haskell. And we take care to handle those functions separately. So we annotate them differently to show that these functions can have side effects. That's purity in a nutshell. 
So how can this possibly be um, of any value, right? A, a pure function can't really do anything. Um, so why would you want to use them? Well, um, th thanks to a coworker of mine who came up with this example. Um, in TypeScript, for example, or JavaScript, it is perfectly valid to define a constant list of elements, pass it around to some functions, which ostensibly read the list, right? They use the values and then come up with a completely different list. Now, the, uh, you know, um, this might seem perfectly fine, but where has Apple gone and where has Coconut come from? If we wish to answer those questions, we have to delve into these functions. And if these functions call any other functions, we have to recurse into those as well. Um, and you know, in a pure language, when a list is changed, we always have an equal sign. So there's this mantra, follow the equal signs and you will find the truth. Um, if you want to know where Apple has gone, well, it's still there because this list was never changed. Um, and where did my other list come from? Ah, bar was the culprit that produced a new value. So what's happening here is that the functions, which are a little bit hard to read because of this wonderful syntax highlighting, foo, bar, and buzz, do not have permission to change our list, do not have permission to change anything that's outside of their domain of responsibility. So we have pretty good control over where our lists go and what happens to them. Um, yeah, so much for purity. Now let's talk about laziness, perhaps the most uh, contentious topic in the Haskell ecosystem. What is laziness? Um, it sounds like Haskell is a really bad language because it's so lazy. Laziness in a programming context refers to the idea that even if we declare a value, but we don't use it, we don't need to compute it. For example, if we declare a very expensive or a very problematic value, such as an error, um, you know, unless it's reached for, the computer doesn't actually have to evaluate it. Now, what is the, val the value proposition of laziness is that we can compose bits of code more efficiently. And again, this is very contentious, so I'll show, so show an example. Um, how can we compose code with laziness? Control flow in programming languages is um, special, uh, usually uses special keywords such as if, while, for, and such. In most programming languages, these constructs are, have special syntax, special handling. But in Haskell, they are just expressions. Uh, and because they're just expressions, they can be like handled as functions, uh, as first class citizens, which means that we can literally take a bit of code that is a control flow expression, such as an if or a loop, well, Haskell doesn't have loops, but bear with me, uh, and put it as a parameter in a function, pass it around, use it as combinators. Um, you know, uh, combinators is one of those fancy words that just means a function that takes another function to produce um, a third function, probably. Um, so we can pass these control flow functions around as first class citizen, which really helps us with refactoring code. Another very shiny uh, gem uh, in the laziness tool belt is that we can have, how did you call them, nominally infinite data structures. We can construct data structures which are infinite. Now, when would we possibly need this? For example, if we have a stream of events, such as uh, you know, a Netflix stream or such, we don't know how large it is ahead of time, have it as an infinite list and just handle it one element at a time. Um, in fact, the building of this data structure doesn't concern itself with which parts of this data structure we'll actually use. Um, I mentioned a list that you know, can represent an infinite stream. So how can we possibly uh, consume an infinite list? Well, we take parts of it, but which parts of it we'll take is not the concern of the code that builds the list. So code that constructs a list or a tree uh, is decoupled from code that consumes subset, that zooms in on it. And that happens to have some very nice um, you know, properties for code reuse. All right, speaking of code reuse. Again, this example is in Haskell, but uh, you know, for the purposes of this demonstration, imagine that Haskell was not lazily evaluated. So Haskell is a strict language now. Or you know, if you wish, imagine this in um, Python. So we have the any function, which takes two parameters. It takes a predicate and uh, a list. So because it takes a predicate, it's a combinator. It also takes a list of values. And this predicate maps each value to a truth value, so either true or false. And we wish to find any element in this list, in this sequence of elements, um, that passes the predicate. In fact, just to make it easier, we can stop when we find the first true, because any is satisfied as soon as at least one element is true. So um, you know. Shouldn't be too hard. Here's the kicker. We wish, to allow, we wish to allow for the possibility for the list to be infinite. So if we simply 
um, if we simply, I don't know, map the predicate to the list, it's never going to finish evaluating and such. So with these restrictions in mind, what can we do? Um, this is a common or the most straightforward way to implement it. We split apart the list, apply the predicate to the first element. Uh, if it passes, we count on the short-circuiting behavior or, of the OR operator, which is lazy in every programming language I know of. Otherwise, we would run into trouble. Um, so it's lazy because if the, first, if the left half of it uh, is true, then the right half of it will not be evaluated. True or anything else is always true. So this is how we could implement it with a strict you know, uh, dialect of uh, Haskell or even uh, other languages. Um, what's the problem with this exactly? Like, what, what's, what's so bad about this? Well, consider what would happen if we made a small little error and inverted the, the operands to this parameter. So any px was on this side and p of x was on this side. This function would never halt. It would never stop evaluating. For an infinite list, it would never stop evaluating. It would first compute the truthiness of every element and then eval uh, evaluate their, correct, uh, their truthiness. Um, but I, OK, this was not, uh, it's not supposed to be a trick. The real problem is that we're falling down to general recursion. Now, it might not look very um, you know, scary, but we are recursing here um, because that's you know, how you can, in the general case, loop in Haskell. Why is you know, using recursion for this task a problem? Because it's, you know, wouldn't it be nicer if we could just use an existing function which loops over this list? So for example, map or filter, right? What are we really doing? We're applying a function to every element and then finding you know, one of them that passes the check. So can't we just use map, which is you know, literally f uh, apply the function to every element? Um, as it happens, this, a, a strict dialect of Haskell does not have potential for code reuse in this, exam, in this situation. Why can't we use map? Because if we map the predicate to the list, it will eagerly evaluate every element of the list and then handle the, uh, let's say, the outer function call. So what can laziness do? In la uh, because Haskell is a lazy language, or, or you know, in any lazy language, we can map the predicate to the list and then use another combinator, or, which is um, amazingly named, the or function takes a list of booleans and says true if any one of them is true. Essentially, it does the same thing as this recursion, but in my opinion, this is much more um, clear in what we are actually doing. Our intent is much more directly expressed. Um, this function, any, is a really small example of this. It's a trivial, almost a trivial example. In the, in the real world, recursion is rarely you know, one line of code or three tokens. Recursion can span many lines and be very difficult to read, very difficult to debug. So having this power to take a recursive kind of control flow and flatten it to a single combinator scales wonderfully. This is, the, this is my aspirant to you. Um, uh, a small little interjection. Uh, uh, Alan J. Perlis once said that a programming language is low level when its programs require attention to the irrelevant. To recap my motivation for learning Haskell. Haskell is a tool that offers, that offers like feature, the features that I've discussed so far allow us to write programs that require very little attention to the irrelevant. We, never, we very rarely need to concern ourselves with things like control flow or truthiness of values or such. That is the, that's the kind of high-level overview of the benefits of Haskell's features. If there are any questions, I will take them at any time, uh, or any complaints, for that matter. Without further ado, the next section of the talk is uh, titled Hello Haskell, which concerns itself with how do we, like once a, once a novice has been hooked into the idea of investing some time to play with Haskell to learn uh, or just to exper experiment with the language, how can they go about doing this? Um, and this is, you know, um, you might not think this uh, a very program problematic issue, but it is a barrier to entry to many people who do, do not necessarily use your favorite operating system or such. So a very nice, uh, let's say, tip that I give to everyone who's, uh, yeah, I apologize for the terrible blue color. It's a link. It's not like you can you know, follow it right now. But <laughs> it is a link to a web page called replit.com. 
uh, has, uh, the, uh, this web page allows us to run Haskell code in the browser without installing anything, without worrying about dependencies. You know, you can close the tab and forget about Haskell forever. That's a nice little uh, escape hatch. And they can, you know, uh, a you can play with um, expressions um, while waiting for your train. So um, I use this all the time, and I, I always tell people to try uh, to play with this website before getting more invested into the ecosystem. That's a nice perk. Um, we all know GHCI, hopefully, if, anyone, if, we're experienced, uh, if a person is experienced in Haskell, they will have come across GHCI. It's essentially the uh, redevelop print loop of Haskell, much like Python. You know, if you run the Python command in your shell, um, you, you enter this prompt which you can put expressions into. What's nice about that prompt is that, you know, you can put some expressions in and see when they explode and um, get some nice errors out of it. That's all nice and well. Here's another cool one, Run Haskell, uh, a tool that for some reason most people in my experience don't know. Haskell is a compiled language. This is you know, what we've been taught. Um, but there is no reason that a compiled language cannot be interpreted uh, or run in a just-in-time compiler or such. So you know, instead of scaring people off with GHC and .o files, um, they can run a Haskell program with this uh, command called Run Haskell um, with zero intermediate steps. And, you know, I have at least one friend who is a Python user uh, who, upon learning just about run Haskell, said, oh, I must check out Haskell because this is my one problem with compiled languages. Fair enough. Of course, we all know the elephant in the room, GHC, the uh, canonical implementation of the Haskell compiler with which we can compile a Haskell source file to a Haskell binary. But um, no one really runs GHC manually. We use a tool called Cabal to uh, develop whole projects when we need to track dependencies and so on. Now, this is the dramatis personae of the Haskell world. Um, there's one more tool, which is called Stack. And you know, the, reason I, the reason for this slide is that there is some confusion, um, especially for an outside observer, as to which tools they should use. I should probably add dot, 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 nix here as well, but we'll get there very quickly. Um, you know, should they use GHC, Cabal, Stack? Maybe they've run, heard about Run Haskell, and um, none of this helps. So, um, you know, <laughs> let's, let's have a look at uh, what the problem with this is. Uh, how do you get these tools? So, you know, you've, you've played around with the browser. Um, you've decided to, ha to, to take these tools for yourself, you know? Like, you want to have them on your laptop when there's no internet connection. Um, so how do you install them? Well, if you're lucky enough to be using Linux, uh, you can just use the, the official repositories, right? Especially on Ubuntu, where um, actually, you know what? I think Ubuntu doesn't even package Haskell packages, uh, at least in the official repositories. There's Arch Linux, which does have Haskell packages in the official repository, but they are broken, so says the Haskell wiki. So um, you know, what now? Um, if you Google around for Haskell tutorials, this is my favorite one. There are, so there was a tool called, the, or a package called the Haskell platform, which was, um, I suppose, created by the Haskell community to help people get out of this pickle. Um, and some tutorials do reference it. It is, it has since become um, neglected and is severely out of date. However, the tutorials persist. So I, ha I have at least one friend who in the past month has installed the Haskell platform and could not run uh, Cabal in it because Cabal was version 2.4 and did not have that command yet. So Haskell platform is another like thorn in the, in the, on the road for uh, learning Haskell. Okay, the latest and greatest um, that the Haskell community has come up with is GHC up, which you know, in the style of Rust up, I'm not sure which one came first, is essentially a glorified bash script, which you, you know, curl and sh in your terminal because that's the way the kids are doing it these days. It's a bash script that um, supposedly, you know, whispers Haskell on your computer with zero uh, effort. And then there's stack, um, which again, so GHC up combines uh, the GHC and Cabal, but not stack. So if, you, if you're following a tutorial that talks about stack, you have to follow two sets of tutorials, one for GHC up, hopefully, and not the Haskell platform, and then separately install stack and hope that everything works together. So that's the current state of the art for beginners who are trying to get into Haskell. This sucks, we can do better. So this is where my talk gets opinionated. Um, and um, anyone who hates Nix might wish to plug their ears. Um, when in the past three years or so, whenever I 
whenever I help people get started with Haskell, but also other programming languages, but Haskell specifically works really well Sp because of this soup of tools that we have. Um, Nix has saved the day. This one command here, assuming that this friend has installed Nix, let's be honest, Nix is a dependency that needs to be installed, but it's much easier to tell a friend install Nix than you know, install Cabal with GHC up from this, from this source and so on. Um, with this one command, this, this student will enter a shell, uh, an environment, which has GHC uh, the uh, and GHCI and run Haskell uh, bundled together. If they want Cabal, they can just add it to the end. Um, the perks of doing it this way as opposed to installing things manually is that this command is stateless. Ah, I should also preface this, apologies. This only works on Linux and a Windows subsystem for Windows. So, you know, uh, full disclosure, it works great on Linux, and if your friend is using Windows, suggest Windows subsystem for Linux. Uh, yeah. Um, the perk of this command is that it doesn't uh, change the state of the operating system. So, it, you know, you're not installing any system libraries, dependencies, binaries, whatnot. When, you know, if you want to throw Haskell in the trash and go learn um, Java, you just exit the shell and Haskell is gone um, forever. Um, it also doesn't change your project, and this is a big one. Um, whenever I... Um, you know, try to woo people into the, you know, allure of Nix for projects, right? Not just for their daily lives. Um, the big promise of Nix is that you don't have to change your project code. You don't have to change the way you're building projects. You're still, you'll still be using GHC and Cabal or Stack. Um, but Nix will just sit as a file which will bring in the dependencies into your project. And this is a really nice perk. It doesn't, it, your project doesn't become a Nix project. It's still a Haskell project just built with Nix. So I mentioned that uh, you know, Ubuntu and Arch and all the other uh, Linux distributions have um, wildly different ideas about what constitutes packaging. Well, Nix is the common denominator. It works <clears throat> the same on every distribution, including macOS. Again, uh, with a small asterisk, there are some rough edges on macOS. But at least Linux distributions, for example, Ubuntu, Arch, and so on, work like a charm. And another nice one is that the versions are shared between collaborators. So, you know, if I ask a friend to run Cabal init interactive to create a Haskell project, I can be sure that if they use a Nix shell to do it, uh, they will be running the same version of Cabal that I am running because we're using the same source repository called Nix packages. Um, this, uh, another contentious point is that Nix is actually pretty easy to get started with. Now, Nix is many things, it's not just a single command, but uh, you know, it's also a programming language with a whole learning curve and so on. But just to get started running Haskell uh, code, all we need is this command and not, nothing else. We don't actually need to learn any language. Now, please correct me if I'm wrong, if you're more knowledgeable about Nix, but the barrier to entry to start to, learn, to, use, to using Cabal and other programming tools with Nix is just one command. Um, and as, you know, as the requirements for complexity grow, as this one Haskell pro uh, pro program turns into a project with dependencies and pinned compiler versions and so on, um, we can add more Nix magic to the project, but we can do so linearly. Like, we don't have to start with a whole behemoth. Um, you know, if you look at a, a Nix project, and it is a behemoth, it looks scary, but it arrived there slowly over time, and at least it works well for everyone. And if that's not enough to convince you that you know, Nix is worth the effort, Nix scales beyond just Haskell. It works also for other programming languages. In fact, it is an excellent uh, weapon of choice for languages which don't have a canonical package manager, such as C and C++, for which it was actually initially kind of developed. They are the prime audience of Nix. Um, in fact, it is easier to build a C project with Nix than it is to build a, I don't know, a Haskell project without Nix or any other project without Nix. This is all the Nix it takes to build a C project. And um, you know, I hope you will agree that it's not very scary. Building a Haskell project is even easier because it's a single line of code and that's better. So um, the, you know, dissecting this line of code is out of scope of this talk, but uh, this is just to show that it takes very little to get started. And um, this is not entirely, let's say, representative of how a developer might use Nix. I have to be fully honest with you. We usually end up adding a little bit more code, uh, which looks scary. And you know, why am I learning another language just to play with Haskell? But if you, you know, take a deep breath and actually 
look into why these lines of code exist there, it's because we have added some nice amenities to our development environment. So we can see that the, we can see that the um, call cabal to Nix file, which is what does all the magic, is still there. We've just added a development shell, which has cabal and Haskell language server for our convenience in the shell. What this means is that with this fi Nix file in, in our repository, we can continue using cabal as the build tool without any uh, change to our workflow. So we can, we can have things like you know, iterative compilation and, and uh, such. Uh, and uh, Haskell language server is also pretty neat. It basically provides auto-completion to VS Code and Vim and such. Um, so you know, that's the appeal of uh, building Haskell with Nix. Any, yeah, what's up? In addition, um, the packages.default uh, line allows you to run your project with one command uh, without even knowing how it is built. You can share it with your friends and tell them, run Hello Haskell, they will issue Nix run Hello Haskell, and if the thing will run, if it ran on your system. Fair enough. Yes, this is a, this is a perk of Nix that I suppose deserves some um, embellishing. Um, Nix exists to share projects between people. So if, uh, you know, if you send your Haskell project to your friend with a Nix file uh, and they have Nix installed, they will most, and if they have Linux, they will most assuredly be able to build it the same way as you did. And if we put this code on GitHub, uh, f you know, your friends and family, if you are so fortunate, can run your Haskell project with a single command. So essentially what? Uh, this Nix Nix shell, yeah, it, it's not very representative. They can run Nix, run the name of your GitHub repository, and it will literally run Haskell on, your, on their um, screen without them ever having to install Haskell or any of the dependencies. So yeah, that's, the, um, that's a nice thing about Nix. It really makes code sharing easier. So that's my, uh, that's my um, you know, that is the advice I have to people getting started with Nix. So there is something to be admitted here. And that is that existing projects that have you know, existed for years and years and have layered complexity in their build systems and so, and so on, that are not yet using Nix, probably will have a really hard time adopting Nix. So there is definitely a learning curve to doing things with Nix. And there's also you know, inherent complexity in switching a complex system from you know, one way of doing things to another way of doing things. Um, I'm not trying to sell you Nix for your project. What I'm, try what I'm trying to sell you is you know, greenfield projects, projects that do not exist yet, but are only in your mind. When you get started with them, consider getting started with Nix from day one, and you will be delighted as, uh, you know, with the complexity curve. Yeah? All good? No heckling? That's, that's very nice. OK, final part of my talk. We've, you've been very brave. Uh, bearing with me so far. So um, this part concerns itself with the actual, like the first tastes of Haskell, the language. Uh, so the, the very first impressions that uh, students often get. And this one is based on, as I said, uh, the past year or so of teaching Haskell to beginners. Uh, it just contains a few um, recommendations that you know, have come up from questions, uh, from common questions. Everyone's favorite topic, language extensions. Why? Our language ex extension is a problem. Because as a beginner of Haskell, you know, looks at examples online, looks at code online, um, these examples that they're, they're, they're looking, uh, can, looking at can ver uh, vary wildly in their kind of expressive power. Haskell is very much a living language. It has been around for um, over 30 years now. And um, you know, during this time, it has uh, picked up a few dialects, so to speak, or um, idioms, if you will. So what can happen is that a student can read some Haskell online and um, see a kind of a, a lexical expression, even like a, a, const a construction which is not valid in um, like vanilla Haskell, but they just have to include the right language extension. And even if you show them how to do this, it's very um, chaotic to them, you know? Like, how do you just know which language extensions to include and so on? The unfortunate thing about language extensions, is, language extensions, much like with dialects, is that there doesn't seem to be a, you know, the canonical set of extensions to uh, include. To be fair, the, you know, there is the GHC 2021 extension, I believe, which the Haskell community has adopted recently. 
to uh, combine a bunch of commonly used language extensions, but that's not quite the same as a standard. And it also doesn't include everyone's favorite overloaded strings, for example. So, you know, language extensions are here to stay, and we can't wish them away. Um, and I think the best way to deal with them is to simply tell people about them, expose learners to language extensions early rather than, uh, earlier, sooner rather than later, and tell them that some of them are okay and some of them are not okay. So, uh, you know, overloaded strings might be your favorite language extension, but it can certainly have, you know, unforeseen side effects to, um, you know, that can surprise you. Um, so, you know, everyone has to make up their own mind, but when it comes to, so for example, one of my favorites is uh, type applications. That one is very safe and you should definitely use it. Um, I really do think so, but um, it's useful to show a beginner that, ah, look at this error. It's saying that you know, something's missing, let's add it to the top of the file. This has two nice, two nice side effects. Uh, when a student has become kind of more intimately introduced to language extensions, they will not glance over them as they're reading an example. Their eyes will immediately spot them at the top of the file, which you know, if you don't know what something is, you just kind of ignore it as you go down to the, uh, you know, to the actual implementation of the file. Um, yeah, and secondly, they will become more proficient in recognizing that something is an overloaded string or not. Okay, basic syntax, uh, very shortly. We hopefully are all aware of um, Haskell's basic syntax. The most confusing part of Haskell to a beginner when they're reading, when they're reading you know, code written in it is um, function application, which is done with spaces as opposed to uh, parentheses. But there are still parentheses uh, to kind of uh, enforce precedence, which is very confusing. So you can have a function call that has spaces and parentheses, but the parentheses are not the function call, they group together function calls. So I think exposure therapy is what works well here. So, um, you know, give someone this exercise, ask them why does this line of code produce the very scary errors that the uh, compiler throws at us. And these errors are scary indeed, because Haskell is very dynamic, or not dynamic and not permissive exactly, but it tries to, f it tries to be very clever about what we meant when we wrote a line of code like this. Functions can be partially applied. I, I, okay, in this case, probably the map m function is overly applied. Um, but yeah, um, it's a good exercise to, um, to, do with your to, to run with your favorite Haskell student to get them familiar with precedence and, um, and function calling conventions. And I believe that this is a major blocker for um, you know, these dollar signs all over the place. What do they mean? The only way to get comfortable with them is simply to practice it again and again, and hopefully this will demystify them. Uh, types, as we discussed, are very important in Haskell, but as we know, the type signatures, or as I demonstrated, the type signatures are optional. What I like to tell people is that functions that have type signatures above them, uh, it's a, so the Haskell, uh, the compiler actually warns you, or is it the linter, I don't, or the language server, I'm not even sure. Uh, but you can get a warning if you don't have top level uh, function signatures. So after telling people that type signatures are totally optional, I also tell them that they should totally write them. Uh, because they are there to help you, the human reader, or other poor souls that have to read your code after you, which might be you tomorrow, uh, understand you know, what the heck it is you wanted to write. And in fact, it even, Ah, in fact, it even um, helps set the stage for the function you're about to write. So I've noticed there's a big, uh, you know, um, a big uptake in confidence when someone who's not entirely sure what they're doing starts with just the type signature of a function. They all already know kind of the shape of what they want to do. They're just not sure. It's not that, it's not that uh, they don't know that, you know, is prime takes an integer and returns a bool. That part is hopefully clear to them. It's just you know, the, the messy details of how it's done that's mysterious. But getting started with the type signature is a really good idea. Another, another uh, I mentioned type applications just earlier. Um, in ha the Haskell compiler is very smart in figuring out which types we wanted to give it, but sometimes it needs some help. Uh, usually because the expression we wrote is somehow ambiguous. A big example of this is the read function, which takes a string and converts it to what exactly? Something that can be read. Um, this is a, this is a Ah, I used read as the last example. This is essentially a from string function in uh, other languages, which in uh, something like C++ or Rust is written with these angled brackets to tell the compiler which type we're expecting to get from it. In Haskell, 
the uh, convention, like the old school conventional way of specifying ambiguous types is with these type uh, annotations, they're called. Um, but I find that specifying them as type applications, which is currently, sadly, a language extension, but will hopefully get standardized, with, language, with type applications, we can treat type types as variables, type variables, they're called. So we can give the function a, a parameter that specifies which type um, it is. And somehow, uh, this, is, this seems to be much more natural for at least my students than the one above. So type applications are great. Um, you should use them um, and teach others to use them. Another important feature in Haskell's basic syntax is type classes. So um, most programming languages have type classes, uh, which they are usually called interfaces. So in Java, they're called interfaces. In C++, I don't think they exist. In Rust, they're called traits. But why this, why this is nice is because most programmers already know them. Um, I've, I've included a little motivational example. Um, I think animals are probably the most beloved example of like hierarchies, and, no, sorry, um, uh, inheritance and uh, these um, uh, interfaces. So, you know, that's the example I go for and works really well. Um, I guess what's of interest is the um, instance uh, syntax. Oh, oh, and I've also used eta reduction here to be extra clever. Uh, that's, really, that's, really worth, um, that's really worth kind of practicing before delving into more complex topics. So when I say more complex topics, we have functor. Now, I didn't say monad. I didn't say the M word. Why did I say functor? Because f functor is the um, underappreciated muscle of the Haskell ecosystem. I firmly believe, and I tell this to everyone, functor, the single type class, is 80% of Haskell magic. If you learn to love the functor, uh, you can read most Haskell code uh, like with a lot more ease and a lot more proficiency. Um, yeah, as I've said, it's the muscle of the ecosystem. And what functor is, is, you know, it's just a function application in a context. It's just a category of monoids and whatnot, right? But um, this, this really, um, it's, it's a really good exercise to try to remove boilerplate with it. So um, again, discussing what exactly functor does is out of scope of this talk. But what's important is to get really cozy with it. So whenever we would normally use a map, consider using functor. And I really love using the operator version of functor as opposed to fmap the function. And this, this is another contentious issue. Some people complain that Haskell is too symbolic for their taste, right? Um, I would argue that the operator version of functor exposes this operation of mapping as the low level operation it rightfully is, and it's sets, like, it, it, it reprograms your brain to think of these kind of traversals as so, so somehow invariants in your logic. You know, you just apply this function to this list or to this tree or whatever. You simply, you know, reach into the box, take out the value, do a function in it, and then put it back in the box. That's what functor is. And the more you use this shorthand operator version of it, the more trivial it becomes. The reason functor is a problem, or uh, the reason I emphasize this, is because functor is, um, is a specific type class. It's not, the, it's not the, the construct of type class, right? If you, tell, if you try to teach someone how to write Haskell type classes, um, they will pick it up in an hour. And then you ask them, oh, can you, um, can you write you know, the functor type class? Fine, they can write it. You can explain to them what functor is. But you cannot explain to them when to use it. And when to use it, that, that's a tricky one. It's a specific type class. So why should they bother with this particular type class? That's, that's where intuition kicks in. So the more, the more exercises you do, the more um, kind of it gets in your bloodstream. Uh, I believe the uh, learned way of calling this is an, uh, an integrated skill as opposed to a uh, com component skill. So, you know, learning all of the basics of Haskell syntax, are, those are component skills, which you just read through a book to learn but functors require special care. And I do not allow people to even say the M word until they have graduated from functors. So functors are the, I would say, the blocker for most learners kind of ability to reason about non-trivial Haskell code. Um, because they're symbolic, because they require an integration of all of the components, all the basic syntax, as well as type classes, as well as intuition for when it's a good idea to use them. So it's absolutely critical that functors are 
practiced and rehashed and you know, you banged against the wall until they are second nature. Until you hear the magic words, oh, this is just a functor. We just put an fmap here. When you hear those wonderful words, you are at ease. Um, Aldous Huxley, the uh, famous uh, English writer, uh, had a wonderful quote on the topic of intuition. Um, and the, the, essentially, the law of reversed effort says that the harder we try consciously to uh, master um, uh, an intuitive skill, the, the less likely we are to succeed. For example, learning a, a foreign language, um, such as German or French, if you're trying to construct sentences with concentrated will, uh, with conscious will, you will be very slow and error prone. And only when this becomes relaxed and error free have you truly mastered it. Um, as he says, you cannot make yourself understand it. You can only foster a state of mind in which understanding may come to you. Now the M word. So we have all graduated from functors. Yes, we have all um, taken care to properly understand functors before going to monads. Here's the trick. There's a big myth. Monads are, like, there's a myth that monads are, there's Haskell and there's monads. And whenever people um, look at, you know, monad tutorials or read about monads or read how in JavaScript promises a monad, they have a tendency to separate monads into its own category. And when they're learning about functors, perhaps all they're thinking about is, you know, this is all well and good, but when will we get to the monads? Here's the kicker, monads are functors. Every, fun every uh, monad is a functor. So if you've learned functor, yeah, if you've learned functor, then you already know 80% of what a monad is. It's just a bit of extra uh, syntax on top of it. So, you know, to take a beginner from the very start to monads, functors are an absolute necessity. And once they understand functors, that's what I would say, once they understand functors, the rest um, they can figure out on their own. Um, and finally, a quote that is totally, you know, not suggested by Albert Einstein, that, who says that, you know, it doesn't require you to be very smart to figure out Haskell. It, you just have to stick with it. In fact, I would, argue, I would say, go as far as to say, if you're capable of writing Python programs that actually run, you're smart enough to write um, Haskell with monads. Thank you. Let's turn around some lights. So, question, ah, I'm so sorry. Questions, discussion, uh, critique, heckling. Now is the time. No, yeah? So, one thing I'm wondering about is, um, you know, you've, you've, you've kind of drawn this nice trajectory where you're like, okay, well, you know, why do we want to, how do we motivate people to learn Haskell? You know, how do we get them over help? I can't even get this to run. And then, you know, what do we start teaching them? Um, my question is then kind of, you know, like, um, when would you say, or like, perhaps the, my question is, until what point do you usually take people? You know, like, um, because there is Haskell and I suppose, programming in general tends to have this thing where, you know, you can design these neat curricula for sort of getting started with something and then you leave somebody to go on their own and they discover they don't know anything yet. Um, but with Haskell, I sometimes get the feeling that like making that second step is hard for the same reason it, it can be hard for people to get into it in the first place. You know, there's a lot of um, stale, sometimes stale material floating out there, uh, approaches that have been abandoned, um, but still persist. So for example, uh, you know, arrows used to be all the rage, not only very weird people use them, but they still exist, right? Um, so my question, I guess, is, is there like a, uh, you know, a distilled, a perfume, an essence of your approach that uh, one could take with oneself to, um, Keep going. Um, okay, so the question is, the, uh, it's a two-part question if I understand correctly. The first question is how far do I take people before uh, letting them free? Um, like how far do I lecture until like the point where they're self-sufficient? And um, the second question. The second part is I guess once you get them to that point, you know, is there, is there something that you, you give them, you know, this is the principle for you to study on your own. Right. 
OK, so the first, the first uh, part of the question has a very um, easy answer. I have told you, functors. Like, I, I, ex I can explain up to functors, but then it's up to practice. Like, there, the, the abstraction ceiling reaches a point where, where um, knowledge gives way to intuition. So, like, once you've learned all of the component skills, once you've learned the basic syntax, the basic building blocks, which really is type classes. I should probably, um, I should probably um, since you mentioned arrows, I should probably say that all I'm talking about is Haskell 98. So it's the, you know, it's the first kind of old style Haskell. With uh, later iterations, we got things like generalized ADTs and all sorts of crazy stuff. Um, but I think this kind of the core of Haskell, uh, sometimes called um, simple Haskell, sometimes called, um, there's other words for it as well, I forgot. But essentially, there, there's a, a lot of desire out there to focus on, I think I lost the microphone. There's a lot of desire out there to focus on the Haskell 98 subset of Haskell um, as, opposed to, as opposed to all of these crazy new features that keep getting you know, added from the language researchers' uh, perspective. So for software engineers, I think Haskell 98 is an untapped well of possibility that you know other languages are barely waking up to. Um, Rust is a living example of this. Um, you know, while you know the language researchers in Haskell are figuring out how to do um, dependent typing and um, yeah, okay, how to do dependent typing and uh, all sorts of um, type wizardry, the rest of the programming community is very happy when they get uh, algebraic data types. So, yeah, my policy is introduce new people to the um, to Haskell 98 subset of language up to functor, and when it turns from raw memorization to um, repetition and intuition, that's where your style has to change from lecturing to sort of mentoring, perhaps pair programming. And I mean, this comes for me personally. This all comes from the reason I do this to begin with. Uh, I don't teach Haskell because I'm a professor, I'm a software engineer. Um, I teach Haskell because I want to have people to do Haskell with. So when we've come to functors and monads, it's like, yay, now we can actually write something interesting, like, I don't know, a card game or something, right? So um, that's my answer, right? Um, just practice with them and they will, they will be able to follow along. Um, and they're able to follow along because of the Hello Haskell uh, section. They have the tools which you have given them. They have the uh, component skills which you've helped them achieve, and that's the gift. So um, you know, give them the basic things that are required to get started. Show them you know how to take those first steps. And once they come to a point where intuition has to take over, you have to trust that they'll have, they'll figure it out. Yeah. So one of the main challenges I found when trying to teach was share Haskell with somebody else is that uh, there are a lot of, um, basically most of this library here is based on mathematical concepts of that kind of stuff. And for like a new beginner to go into Google and uh, find a signature for, uh, I don't know, like the applicative operator or something like that, and they start reading about it, they're, they're, they are very fast and uh, easily uh, overwhelmed with uh, whatever they're reading. So it's like how, how, how to approach uh, yeah, like normal people who don't really have, don't really care about the mathematical background, uh, but they just want to work on a on a program. They see they've seen the uh, the guarantees that Haskell provides, and they're like, oh yeah, cool, okay, let's try this. Let's give it a try. Um, okay, so the question is, how do you how do you how do you cushion Google or someone? How do you soften the blow of the sheer amount of information that searching for anything about Haskell drops on your screen, and you know now you're in the deep end. Um, well, you mentioned that when you talk to friends about the perks of Haskell, and I, I do this a lot um, when I tell people about the perks of Haskell, and they go off and they Google something, and they you know all this you know um, all of these operators and their friends show up. Um, yes, it's overwhelming, absolutely, but. That's exactly what the, what this talk is all about. Essentially, starting from the very essentials, like yes, never you mind 
applicable functors, you know? Let's get started with where the parentheses go. Because you, you would be surprised. I mean, it's not even condescending, it's very empathetic, knowing a large part of showing people Haskell is showing them something and realizing that, you know what, this is too clever. I don't know what I was thinking. Let me, let me replace this dollar sign with parentheses, just to make it more, you know, humanly approachable. The dollar sign is really um, problematic. Now, the one place I don't do this is the counter. Because as I said, I'm a pretty, uh, pretty um, strong proponent of treating you know, functor applica function, this functor application in context as a low-level operation. But my um, trick to making people you know, not scared of that is to say, you want to learn it? I'll, I'll help you. you know? like, yes, it's scary, but there's like really simple principles behind it, up to functor. Haskell is a language with a scary high abstraction ceiling. You can read some high, absolute hieroglyphs if you delve into some libraries. But I don't tell people to delve into libraries. If they show a genuine interest in Haskell, uh, you know, take uh, Replit, which I showed, and try to solve some, I don't know, some prime number calculation or some such. And that will give you a taste of Haskell. Now, the other thing you said was that um, Haskell has these mathematical underpinnings. Um, as someone who studied maths, that's nonsense. There is no mathematics in uh, Haskell. Uh, the type system is based on, um, uh, sorry, not the type system. The abstractions are based on uh, category theory, yes. But do you actually need to know category theory to use them? No. Um, everyone who has written a program in, a program in any language has written, has written loops before. They have composed, ah, yes, algebraic function uh, composition and stuff and so forth. Well, if you've called functions, you've graduated algebra. That's it. Like, you are already doing it. Haskell just makes it, you know, strict. So that if you make a mistake, it will tell you. So, just to finish this line of thought, um, it doesn't take a PhD to start writing Haskell. A master's degree is perfectly sufficient. No, it's like, you know, put string, hello world, it's not that scary. If you have the right tools. Um, um, I think a major part of getting people to cushioning Haskell for people is to show them the basic building blocks, to tell them that operators are indeed terrible, but such is life, and to learn to teach them how to read compiler output. Compiler output, there's some errors, right? To teach them how to. I would say that learning any language is learning how to decompose the compiler error output. Um, be it, you know, Python with its strange errors, or uh, how to even get the errors, right? um, or Haskell. And it's scary. The, the compiler is telling you you're stupid, you, like everything you've written is terrible, it doesn't run, right? So, you know, staying calm, oh, that's very interesting, look at that. You know, there's no instance for num a. Ha ha, you know, how silly of us, we need to add it. You know, just kind of fostering this kind of conversation with the compiler, I think also gets rid of all of that here. Yeah? Let's keep the ball rolling, any other questions, any beginners? Has anyone been uh, convinced to try doing their next project with Haskell with Nix? No? Yes. Yes. But I was probably going to do that anyway, but you've extra good <laughs> <laughs> I'm very good at selling to people who have already bought it. Um, yeah. So, if that's all, then I'm looking forward to seeing you at the, at the after party. <laughs>